So a while back, I decided to play around in DaVinci Resolve, but I wasn't quite sure what to make, so I decided to go online for some inspiration. It wasn't long before I found Tipo's video on Rilla, and I really enjoyed it, so much that I decided to create a motion graphic edit inspired by the intro of his video. After a couple of days of dragging nodes, clicking buttons, and adjusting parameters, I ended up with this. So in this video, I thought I'd give a step-by-step -step breakdown of how I made the edit, well, this particular portion of the edit, and share some of the things I learned during the process. The first thing I did was observe the composition that I was drawing inspiration from, and a couple of things caught my attention. The first was the arrangement of the images. Each image was organized in rows to form a grid. These rows then animate horizontally across the screen, moving in opposite directions to introduce a new image while removing an existing one from the frame. But that's not all. If you observe each image closely, you will notice a slight chromatic aberration on the images, an artistic style that the artist Rilla uses to stylize her work. It's also the visual effect that Tipo utilizes to create a visual consistency. This effect felt like the central theme to include in the edit, and without it, it just felt like something was missing. So I decided to incorporate it as well into the recreation. However, the trickiest part of this composition was actually understanding how it was transitioned into the frame. At regular speed, it just passes you by, so I decided to go through the composition frame by frame to get a better understanding of what was happening. And after watching it, I still had no idea how to create it. The best way I could describe what I was watching was that the composition felt like a piece of curved paper slowly moving backwards to rest on a surface. It was still a puzzle for me, but I wrote it down anyway and decided that I would resolve it when I get there, no pun intended. The first thing I did was grab some image assets that I could work with. You can use any image that you like, but spoiler from doing this already, you wanna pick images that have the same aspect ratio. That way you don't struggle with alignment issues like I did. My final composition has two groups of images that form a row. So I'll need to merge these images on their own background before bringing them together to form the entire composition. Here's how I did that. So what you're looking at now is a high level overview of my node graph. Basically all the images over here represent the top row and all the images over here represent the bottom row. And um, this is essentially my transform node and merge nodes, which are all being sent to the media out. If you take a closer look at the images that make up my bottom row, you can see that the first thing I did was put a background, empty background node and that gets sent up as the background. My first image is merged on that. I need the transform to be able to move that image if I need to, to resize it. And then this gets sent, sent as the background for this image to go on top of, and that's piped up as the background for this image. And that's piped up as the background for this image. You can't see this image right now on the screen, but if I select that, you can see it's hidden over here. Um, Basically, this is my bottom row, which I use this transform node to pull everything down. I did the exact same thing for the top row. Started with an empty background, send that upwards, put my first image on top of that, which becomes the background for the next image, and then and the next, and the next. And this guy is basically on this side over here, and I use the transform node to sort of move that entire row. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much how I accomplished that. Once my images were positioned in a grid format, I added keyframes to animate them horizontally in opposite directions. I wanted the animation to last for 1.5 seconds, which is about 36 frames. Once the keyframe animation was done, I moved over to applying the first effect for the composition, and that is chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is when white light starts to separate at the edge of an image. It is a visual effect that's used heavily in a lot of games and movies, and I've always wondered the physics behind it. Apparently, White light is a combination of all the visible spectrums of light, and in photography, when white light passes through a photographic lens, it gets refracted. The further away the light is from the center of the lens, the greater the refraction. Chromatic aberration occurs when the visible colors that make up white light are not refracted by the same amount. This is the sort of thing that early photographers try to avoid in their work, because it ruined the image that they were trying to capture. But today, it's employed as a visual aesthetic. It makes you wonder how many effects were considered annoying mistakes in the past or considered unappealing in a different artistic medium. I guess it depends on how you use them. 
All right, so if you look over here, you see that I've applied the chromatic aberration node. On my left viewer is the regular image, and on my right is the chromatic aberration being applied. And you can tell that it's applied by if you take a by taking a closer look at the images, you can see that the character here just shows up as normal, whereas the image here, it, you can see that chromatic aberration, the, the RGB values split it off at the edges. And you can basically set any you can make it very intense if you want. You can dial it back for that aberration to be done like in the opposite direction. I just wanted it to be very subtle, so I went for like 0.13-ish. And that gave me the results that I wanted. To achieve the effect of moving the composition backwards, I decided to use something called the DVE node. When I first discovered this node, I was absolutely excited because I thought that in order to make a 2D image appear 3D or to give it some 3D transformations in Fusion, you could only use a 3D image plane. But turns out, you don't. DVE stands for Digital Video Effect. I don't know why it's named that, but it's simply a 3D transformation tool. It allows you to apply 3D transformations to a 2D image. It has three inputs. An orange input for the 2D image we want to transform, a white input called the DVE mask. It's used to mask the image prior to applying the DVE transform. You can think of it as using a mask to select the part of the image that you actually want to transform. And lastly, we have the blue input that works like a regular mask, basically specifying the area where our DVE effect is revealed. All right, let's take a look at how I use the DVE node in this composition. On my left, I have my Chrome aberration, as you can see here. And on my right, I have my DVE node showing up there. If I go to my zero for my first frame, you can see the DVE node um, on my right. I didn't really do much here with this. I just simply moved, animated the Z, as you can see. It moves backward, uh, thanks to the Z move um, controls there. And then I also added like a subtle rotation to it using the X um, axis. So on the X there, I did it across 20 frames and you have that slow movement down. So you, I'm going to zoom out here so you can actually see that rotation taking place. So if I zoom out, you can definitely see that's my plane and that's pretty much about it. When I got to the part where I needed to add some curvature to the entire composition, I remembered a node that I'd used in the past and that was the lens distortion node. You can use this node to remove or add distortion to your image. In our case, we want to add. All right, let's take a look and see how I made use of the lens distort node. So on my left, I have a new distort that I'm using to demonstrate and show you guys its effect. And on my right, I actually have the lens distort node that's responsible uh, for the composition that I actually used in the composition. So the first thing I actually did was I set the mode to distort. And then I applied a little bit of distortion there. If I go back upwards, I also animated the curvature Y and the quartic distortion. So if I go to the curvature Y, you can see that 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 give a little bit of a stretch up and down, up and down stretch. So I applied a little bit of a subtle stretch that I animated over time. So you can tell that that stretch comes down over time you can literally see it coming down over time and i also animated the cortic distortion and reset that on my test so my test here is on the left okay and then if i do distort uh you can see what how far the distort takes us 0.5 if i do cortic distort you can see there it's so cortic I think the distortion here looks a little bit more. Why the cortic is, yeah, the cortic is not as much as the actual distortion itself. When you combine both of them, it goes way deeper. Pretty much, I animated those parameters um, from zero to around thirty frames, so around a second, just about a second, and everything just comes in. The distortion here. It's what's responsible for giving it that that fold, right? That fold that you see over there, that little fold, right? That like that feeling of curved paper, right? And then I use the curvature Y to kind of stretch it a little bit. 
if I go around here. So I use the curvature Y. Kind of stretch it a little bit to have that effect. Because this is okay, but that stretch just sells the effect a little bit more. Then I put a little bit of Quartic just because, again, it's part of selling that effect, right? So without, if I push the Quartic, everything is going off to the side. So it adds to that curved, that curved feeling, that curved paper-like feeling, um, that curved paper-like look. Oh, and by the way, I also, don't forget to ease out your keyframes that way you really get some smooth um some smooth functionality here so i added just a little bit of easing nothing too much just ever so slightly and just you know close you can play around with this and see what you get um you can get some really interesting stuff but that's how i did it our motion graphic edit is almost done the only thing we need is to reveal each image one by one. I kind of did this in a very complicated way, a way that I would not recommend. I later realized that there was a better way to do this. So what did I first do? I'll show you. I basically had a mask that went over the screen to reveal the grid of images. But the problem with that was I needed another mask to hide the parts that I didn't need revealed. So I ended up using two masks together and adjusting your paint node in order to get the desired outcome that I wanted. Paint node meaning how those two masks interact, how they affect each other. A much more better way to do this is simply to go into the keyframes panel and essentially pull back when the images start. Once you do that, maybe a particular image starts later at frame, I don't know, 25 or 30, you get that image only showing up at that frame. Everything before that, it's not there. So by simply dragging that for each image and setting it one or two frames apart, you will get your desired effect. But I didn't know that then, or I forgot that. <laughs> and just by doing that, ladies and gentlemen, you will get this composition. And there you have it. The breakdown process behind the MoGraph edit. The project definitely expanded my understanding of Fusion as a compositing software, as well as gave me a better understanding of the nodes that I knew very little about. And I can only imagine the other possible creative applications of these tools. If you'd like to see more videos from me sharing some of the things I've been learning during my free time, be it motion graphics, web development, feel free to hit the subscribe button, or you can check out some of my older videos as well. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.